Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tana John. Um, so yeah, this this morning we have the great opportunity to have an interview, have a conversation with uh, Tana John Jayasaro. And just as a brief word of introduction, I'll give a collapsed biography. So Ajahn Jayasaro was born on the Isle of Wight in England in 1958 after a pan-Asian pilgrimage and much hitchhiking through Europe. Ajahn Jayasaro joined Ajahn Sumedho's community in England as a monastic trainee. And in late 1978, he traveled to Thailand to ordain at Ajahn Chah's monastery, where he took full bhikkhu ordination in 1980. After years practicing in various monastic communities throughout Thailand, Ajahn Jayasaro took up the post of abbot of Wat Phan Anachat, the largest monastery for international Theravada monks in the world from 1997 to 2002. After his 10 years abbot, while he turned to a more solitary mode of living. He also became involved in Buddhist education, a passion and commitment he maintains to this day. Serving as the direct spiritual advisor for several Buddhist elementary and high schools, Ajahn Jayasaro has authored numerous books, both in Thai and in English, including the biography of Ajahn Chah in Thai and its revised English counterpart entitled Stillness Flowing. In 2019 to 2020, Ajahn Jayasaro uh, 2021, Ajahn Jayasaro was honored with a series of royal monastic titles by Thailand's King Bajira Longkorn. And in March, uh, he was granted Thai citizenship by royal decree. Ajahn Jayasaro currently lives alone in a hermitage 100 miles from Bangkok and has established a further four hermitages in the surrounding area where his students reside. He teaches weekly at the nearby Buddhist high school and bi-weekly at a Buddhist elementary school and at the Meditation Center, Bon Boon. So thank you to, so much, Tana John, for, for joining us for this. Yes, thank you, Tana John, and it's a pleasure to see you. And now that you can actually hear me, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, Good. Um, see you. Yeah, Tana John, we just, um, you know, Ajin Kobilo and I are both uh, approaching this you know, trying to navigate our way through this whole monastic life and interaction with the Sangha. And we had questions um, to do with Sangha dynamics and various uh, themes on that. So um, my first question, um, if I can ask was, the Sangha has always had to balance its progressive and conservative elements, a dynamic represented even in the time of the Buddha by the disciples, Venerable Mahakasapa, a more conservative figure and Venerable Ananda, a more progressive one in some senses. How do we find the right balance in the Sangha between embracing change while preserving tradition? In which areas and issues of Sangha life do you see this tension most pronounced right now? Um, yeah, I'm not convinced by the characterization of, of, of Ananda as a, as a progressive, I think that's more of a, a Mahayana um, uh, take on, on Venerable Ananda. I mean, although we know he has kind of soft spot for the ladies, I think. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, I look at it um, more in terms of culture, and we have a, a monastic culture, and the the culture I think is is transmitted both in terms of like the spirit and the letter, and I think that the, let's say more progressive. Um, figures tend to, to look on traditions as being attached to the letter and forgetting the spirit. Whereas the conservatives would say, uh, you're just um, getting caught up on, uh, on the continuity of the letter, but you're not seeing the, the spirit within it. And we're afraid if you make too many changes then you'll lose the spirit because you don't know you don't understand the relationship correct relationship between spirit and letter so i think that 
that's one way of looking at sort of differences of approach. Um, nevertheless, I, th I think it's fair to say that Theravada is, sees itself certainly as the conservative wing of the Buddhist world, if you like, and um, our identity is, uh, has been tied to this um, commitment to um, uphold what we take to be the original teachings and uh, not to add or subtract from them. In practice, of course, given um, human foibles and failings, um, what that means is that rather, in some cases, rather than adding to or, or, or subtracting or just kind of ignore certain rules, um, more like, uh, more often, there is the effort to re reinterpret um, in ways that maintain that sense of respect for tradition um, and yet allow for some change to take place. So that can be seen as um, a creative response to changing conditions or can be seen as a kind of a sneaky way of getting around the rules. Again, it's, it's a difference of perspective. Um, we, we do have, of course, the, the four great standards as our guideline in responding to change. But of course, that is um, open to interpretation, whether, whether or not some new development um, is in fact in line with those things the Buddha allowed or those things that the Buddha forbid. Uh, it's not always such a, a clear cut um, issue. And um, I, I, my mind goes to the question of whether monks can drive cars. And in Thailand, it's, uh, there are monks who drive cars in Thailand, but they're really looked down upon by most monks and lay people. But in, and, and I think our, the logic that I follow regarding cars is that it, they are inappropriate because um, the, the amount of power that you have um, and the, um, it seems to be inconsistent with the, with the, the way that summoners should um, travel but more importantly, it seemed to me almost impossible to, to drive a car without having to use money, whether it's for insurance or for gas or for whatever. So those, those are the kinds of arguments that you're familiar with why, why it would be inappropriate for, for monks to drive cars. Whereas I, I've met monks in, in the States who do drive um, and they're rationale is that we should be easy to look after and that where there is a very small pool of lay supporters of of a temple and that they may live 10 miles 20 miles away from the monastery if every time you had to go out um, you have to um, ask somebody to come pick you up and take you and then pick, take you back and then go home again. And um, it's inconsistent with the, the kind of care and, and consideration that monks should have for uh, their lay supporters. So their rationale would be that 
um, driving would be um, consistent with principles of monastic life, which the Buddha laid down and, and emphasized a great deal. So, so the, yeah, the, the, there's a certain amount of, of flexibility and, and room for interpretation, isn't there? Um, the also we're we're always you know in the middle of something. You know, it's like when you look back on, on, on history, the the most important thing about um, people in the past is they didn't know what was going on. You know, so, we, you know, let's say Second World War, we all know that it, it lasted well, in Europe from 1939 to 1945, but absolutely nobody involved in the Second World War knew that. And that was very much an uh, important part of how they understood it, how they reacted to it, what they thought about it, the fact that nobody knew what, what was going to come in the future. And, and it's always the same. Right now we're in the middle of this, uh, all these different technological advances. We don't have the sort of the big picture, the long, the long view of the um, the pros and the cons and the long-term benefits and long-term damage that um, these things can um, result in. So, so we're always in a, you know in a bit of a in a bit of a fog. Um, and I think that being the case, that I I I, I tend to um, gravitate towards the more Theravada, conservative style of um, safety first. And um, when you're not really sure how something is going to play out, then um, be very um, careful and, um, yeah, uh, not just to embrace things uh, too much. So I think maybe embracing change might be uh, a dukkata for um, in a appropriate contact with the changing world. Yeah. <laughs> Tanajan, you bring up... Um, That's an inside joke. If the <laughs> monastic's watching this, you won't get that. We, we got it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I mean, it, it brings up an interesting point, Tanajan, in that... Um, you know, this tension between how much we adjust the form to the culture versus how much the culture, we trust that the form will change the culture. Say with the driving thing, like how much do we adjust to accommodate the surrounding lay people versus trust that if we remain true to certain interpretations of not driving, that they will step forward and, and provide that service. Um, it feels like there's sort of a unique role with the Sangha in that it's, um, there's such an archetypal uh, role occupied by the renunciant that it, it, there's an aspect of it which is both timeless in a sense and also, um, uh, yeah, some, somewhat perhaps not, uh, not permeable to the sort of winds of culture in quite the same way because it is an archetypal role within a culture and maybe has more power to change the culture as well. I know that Thailand and every culture where the monastic song has moved into is Buddhism's affected it very deeply. So I'm, I'm curious if you see a sort of a special reflection there for the Sangha as opposed to any other role which might move through time and society. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a really difficult one because I, I I think for for monks to to be considerate of the feelings of the lay people and not to be imposing upon them and not to take them for granted is is a you know wherever you are, whatever country you're living in, and whatever the culture, those are um, um, universal principles for a a mendicant monastic. Um, but it's sometimes it, it, it's difficult to 
distinguish that wholesome consideration from um, a desire to be popular. Um, and I think for, for that reason, it, it, it's good to, you know, when you go to live somewhere, then explaining to, to the lay people, you know, just the, the concept of a samana and that, you know, sometimes the way we live um, can be, uh, can seem unnecessarily awkward and sort of finicky and, and making a, um, a big fuss about what seem to be small matters. Um, but, you know, this is, and, and I don't think that we can always justify every, every single training rule we have. Some, some of them do seem quite bizarre, certainly when they're taken out of context. But the, the idea of, well, this is my culture. You know, this is my monastic culture. Um, and it's, it's like one package, you know. Um, and if you let people know beforehand, you know, this is the way you do it, these the principles, I, I think that's, that, that lay people can uh, accept that a lot more, more easily. If, if, if we want lay, people, lay Buddhists to have some uh, real respect for our, our vinaya and, and have that wish to help us to keep it, then I think that's undermined if we start saying, well, that rule doesn't really matter and this rule doesn't really matter. So we may be able to you know, create a, a kind of a, a hierarchy and say, well, that's just a, a dukkata or that's just a this or just a that. But for lay people who don't have the sort of the, the big picture of the vinaya, it's well, yeah, some things they, they seem quite happy to abandon and some things they don't, you know, and, and they can't see the, um, the reason behind it. It's not, it's not so clear cut to, a, to someone who's not had our education or training. So um, I, I think Ajahn Chah's very simple guideline, you know, is that just try to keep all the rules and then if something really doesn't work, then think about changing it, but um, not to not to change anything uh, too easily because um, the message it sends to people is it's not really that important to you, you know. Mm. And Tanajan, um, thank you. And sort of on that note, um, how do we how do we remain, you know, moving into this new environment, especially as young, younger monks, how do we remain humble? Like what, what have you found was helpful for was helpful for you in that respect? Meditation. <laughs> I don't think that uh, certainly uh, the sort of the more subtle kinds of conceit um, can resist um, meditation, but um, I think for anyone who's putting time and effort into um, formal practice um, should be able to um, see through that kind of pride and, and um, uh, arrogance and lack of humility um, for for what it is, but I think that that um, you know, point I often make here, talking about gratitude, is that you know often people teach gratitude as like something you should have. A good person should be grateful. You should not be ungrateful. You should be grateful. And it's like um, an act of will um, involved. Um, but for me, the more you investigate and penetrate causality, all the causes and conditions that have led you to be where you are now, to have the, uh, the gifts, the abilities, the um, 
even the, the requisites, um, you know, beginning with the requisites, of course, but going on to the, uh, the qualities, wholesome qualities within your heart. Um, when, you, when you see all the people who have been involved, from your parents and your school teachers and your, and your spiritual teachers and your colleagues and friends and students, then I, I can't see how uh, you can fail to be humbled by that. I think I think that you know humility is sometimes you know that uh, sort of sometimes uh, you don't want to characterize it as Christian humility, but but that idea of you know you uh, as a penance washing people's feet and and doing all these kind of special practices or they they might help you to be humble but they're not expressions of humility because often there's this there's this still kind of look at me i'm so humble um kind of feeling there especially in the more kind of spectacular expressions of humility but um the, what i would consider like an authentic humility just be, comes from saying well there's nothing that's good and noble and, and wholesome in my heart that I can I can say is I, I created that out of nothing you know it's uh, dependent on so many different people and so many uh, supporting conditions and that's for me is a very kind of natural and, and uh, yeah unselfconscious kind of humility thank you Panajan. that was um, relevant um, one more question for me, if I could. In Christian monastic circles, they speak about the need for generative roles, where monastics have the chance to contribute creatively to a community and to channel the natural desire to affect change in wholesome ways. I have felt and heard others reflect that some monasteries lack sufficient generative roles, one of the few validated one, ones being that of abbot, a role many don't feel drawn to. How can the Sangha address this, or does it need to? What roles or, or alternate models of the monastic life might be cultivated in order to decrease disrobles? How can we make the lineage accommodating of more personality types? Well, we are uh, uh, so certainly compared when I first became a monk, the forest tradition um, is a much broader church, let's say, than it was, uh, and far more accommodating. Uh, it was basically, you know, the real practice is, you, you know, you get up in the morning, you do walking, uh, ch morning chanting, bindabar, uh, you do chores, you, you meditate, and anything else is kind of like, um, you know, an acknowledgement of failure, as it were, or that you're you're a deviant, you know, even sort of reading and, and study is kind of looked on with, with kind of like, um, is, is this just a distraction from the real practice? Um, so there are a num number of sort of cultural reasons for that, I think. And um, it, it's not like it's, it's uh, in the kind of the forest monastic DNA as it were but that's at least the, the tradition as it was um, in that particular phase of like 40 years ago so I think that with the uh, over time for various reasons and with the um, branching out overseas where um, in many countries, just not possible to live in the, you know, in, in the same way they did in the forests of Northeast Thailand and different uh, expectations and environments. That um, there's been a, um, a, a, I, I would say, like a, a wider, richer number, uh, sense of vocation than there was, and that. In the old days, if you just if you got ill or you got sick or you just you know you just couldn't hack with the sort of the, that uh, kind of austere lifetime lifestyle, then it was you know just disrobe and 
Um, and now there, there are so many other uh, opportunities to live a life of a, of a bhikkhu. Um, and I think that, that let's go back to that when I was, uh, when I first arrived, there were very few terrors. You know, even to get to five pansas was considered a big achievement. So, it, you know, we were all very motivated and very um, idealistic, I would say. But it's over the course of time and leading a monastic life for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years um, that... Um, you see that that kind of um, full-on walking, sitting um, practice for, for Nibbana is an incredible barami for that. And, and I'm not even sure that, that um, even with, with great barami, it's always the best approach. And... And so I, I think that uh, opportunities for, for other activities which are not in conflict with uh, Dhamma Vinaya, um, but which give some sense of short term, more mundane um, sense of uh, competence, of accomplishment, of, of value um, are, are really good, good things. And before it was like we put all of our eggs in one basket, in the meditation basket. And if you've been a monk for some years and still struggling for, uh, with formal meditation, you know, pe people really sort of uh, get depressed and, and uh, full of, you know, lacking a sort of self-respect and self-esteem. I'm hopeless, you know, and I'm, I'm doing this. I'm up at three o'clock in the morning and going until 10, 11 at night. And I've just given my whole life to this and, and nothing, uh, you know, you get that sort of negative. It's all been for nothing. And, and um, yeah, and I, I agree that the, and I think that this was one of the lessons that was learned from the first wave of, of disrobings of senior monks in our tradition, that um, beyond the, the, the obvious um, conclusion that these monks were drawn out of monastic life by sexual desire, in many cases it was more desire for for connection and warmth and affection um, and that um, the sexual dimension was not uh, necessarily central to it um, or not, not a necessary part of it. Um, and that, that was the beginning of, of really uh, concerted efforts to uh, keep in touch with each other and to sustain friendships and uh, just a recognition, you know, it is kind of macho tradition, let's say, I think, um, when I was first here. And, you know, acknowledging that as a senior monk, you, you feel a bit lonely and isolated. That was, you know, you don't do that, you know, just auton, you know, and it's, uh, um, and and I think that um, opening up and, and, and those kinds of good friendships and sharing uh, both formally and informally and, and by uh, telephone and, and email. And, you know, there was even to have telephones and emails was a huge uh, issue for, for many years, you know, whether we should have telephones in the monastery. The first landline, that was like a major... Uh, landmark in the history of the monastery. Um, 
And I think that, that the pros have far outweighed the cons as far as being more uh, easy to, to keep in touch. So I, I, I think this is a good thing of the, you know, of your generation and, and subsequent generations that you, um, it's just common sense, obvious, and, you know, to keep in touch and keep up with each other and, um, uh, and you know, it, it was something that, that came to my generation really um, against the grain and again, and, and just a sense of this isn't really working, you know, that um, everyone just sort of uh, pushing on and pu pushing through things. And, and then you get to a point where you just get run down and weak and, and um, there's some might be crisis with the lay people or crisis with uh, difficult monks and, and, and then you become very vulnerable. Uh, John, this is a uh, very, very helpful. Um, yeah. And I, I certainly can attest to that in my own experience, like the value of opening up and, and the value pace, placing value on communication and friendship. And as what you, um, what you alluded to earlier is just finding some other ways of nourishing, which are in line with the, uh, the Dhamma specifically study and meeting, you know, study monks, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's just the most beautiful mm. human being, who's just, you know, a, mm. a bright light, you know, who's been in the robes for almost 50 years. And um, I certainly see the value of that and really appreciate that you acknowledge that and, and, and talk about that aspect of things. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, there are these discourses on monks, there are these roots of trees, there are these empty dwellings, meditate, lest you regret it later. And I'm curious if you might be able to speak to, to that side of things, like for people who might be more inclined, like I, I really love to study. Um, some people love to study more than meditate. Like, yeah. So what, how do you encourage people? What's, what's the scope? What is well, the Buddha? Well, yeah. well, you know, there's, there's uh, if, we, if you sleep five or six hours at night, you know, under trees and um, and to um, find enough time for both. I don't think there has to be a, a conflict um, between them. But uh, well, ultimately, you know, if if um, liberation is our is our ultimate goal, um, then that's um, it's not going to come through study by itself but I, I I prefer to see the, the three the three dhammas of pariyati pati bhati and pativeta as a sort of an organic whole and and how much how much study you know or what is the the connection uh, relationship between study and pariyati well I I would say pariyati is um, the study that leads to bhati bhati and bhati veta. So if, if study leads you away from meditation, then that's a, an indication that it you that it's out of balance. You know, if you, if it's if it's like from time to meditate should be uh, you, know, you find some resistance to meditation and looking to study as a, as a refuge in. Um, in opposition to, to, to meditation and practice, then, then I think that that's lost its way and, and, and practice also for, for Patiweta. So those three things are connected, you know, really intimately connected. But I think that um, even that kind of dichotomy between study and and, and meditation, it doesn't always stand up that, you know, look, taking reading suttas, listening to suttas, chanting suttas um, can also be a form of bhavana and a form of practice. Um, and it can be uh, more calming and can bring up piti um, in a way that, um, say, focusing on, on the sensation of the breath cannot. So, so some people just have a real affinity with 
um, with study and can use study as a uh, as a path of practice in itself so you know there's different ways of looking at it you know so um, but I don't want to I don't see these two things as being mutually exclusive and having to find a balance between them in, in every sense I mean that's one way of looking at it but some some people when they study then they just caught up in it and um, become very you know opinionated and, and full of ditty and uh, uh, judgmental etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's someone who just doesn't have that real affinity with, with, with words and study and then someone else um, can just find it uplifting and um, inspiring and and actually leading onwards or leading inwards. So it's like it's an open eye. Can come. Yeah. Thank you, Tana John. On kind of a related topic to study as bhavana, what about teaching as bhavana? There's a, a popular mm-hmm. modern aphorism that, you know, to teach, to learn something, you should teach it. And I'm wondering about that in, in relationship to, um, yeah, in our tradition, you know, someone would typically stay in a monastery for a dozen years before they start teaching or you know some people even say wait till you're a sotapanna wait till you're a stream enter before you start teaching and i'm curious what your take is well i think if we all held to that view the sasana would probably disappear by, by now um <laughs> i i think that, that um First of all, going to, to evidence in the suttas, you know, the, the, the instructions given by the Buddha um, to Dhamma teachers, you know, to teach um, step by step and to teach without um, criticizing and running down other people, to teach without desire for any kind of gain. The, mm. These are not teachings for Arya Pukulas. Mm-hmm. These, 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 these are teachers for, for um, I, w- I would say, um, yeah, Samuti Sankha, I mean, to monks who are in a position of, of teaching and the history of propagation and, and, and uh, transmitting of the Dhamma is much more being the province of what Ban monks or um, Gamawasi monks than Aranyawasi monks um, and that you know that we have a Buddhist culture in countries like like Thailand is because of the uh, the village monks not because of the forest monks I think mean, we should uh, <laughs> recognize our debt of gratitude to them um, the as you know the Ajahn Chah tradition um, in many ways uh, follows the 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 Ajahn Man style, but in certain key areas it deviates from it. Ajahn Chah didn't follow that. And then that, this is one um, very prominent example where he encouraged monks from, you know, from five punches onwards to take responsibility in all different areas of the monastic life, to have it like a well-rounded monastic education rather than simply being full-time meditator and this, this um, connects with the point we were talking about just now you know knowing how to build how to chant how to how to uh, teach the lay people you know that we 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 have a very rounded monastic education in the Ajahn Chah tradition um, but the so so certainly I think it was Ajahn Chah's view that you learn through teaching you know because he he acknowledged the monks of six seven eight months you know they're far from having finished their practice um but it's a form of dana it's dhamma dana it's very meritorious um but it's also i think contributes to the uh to the learning or it can do the learning of the monk i myself on a um uh, I, I think we've spoken about this before. If I hear or um, learn anything new, the first thing I do is try and tell somebody about it because it sticks in my mind if I do that. Um, and as I get older, I tend to forget things. So it's very important to do that. 
and um, the I think in, in, in many many occasions um, I've observed that that we can study things and then tell ourselves that we really understand um, and develop quite serious blind spots or area at least areas where kind of fuzzy and we haven't really done the work of, of going through it really really clearly and and the best way of exposing that is when having to explain it to somebody else because you know you it, it becomes really clear you you know you you can't oh yeah i just um you know i just assumed that i knew that and then but i didn't really um and so from when i first started teaching i i found that teaching exposes mercilessly exposes any areas of, of uh, confusion or ignorance um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that um, I'm also found that again speaking from my my experience that the continually trying to find ways of making the teachings more clearer, uh, more applicable, more approachable, more inspiring, um, is, um, is a way that, that, that sort of I can see all kinds of, of beneficial effects on my own, um, my own jitta and essentially it's a, it's a practical expression of, of metta and, and karuna you know this the the commitment to trying to clarify the dhamma and to tr transmit it as clearly and accurately to others as possible you know it's it's like doing one's duty as a samana um and and repaying debt of gratitude to to student and, and both plastic and lay. So, so you know, you can, when we use the word, word teaching, then you know, you sort of teacher and student, but it, it's, it's more like dhamma-dhana, mm. you know, mm. and, and, and doing the work of, of the mm. samana in helping to sustain and transmit the, the true dhamma in, in the society in which we live. Mm. Tanajan, on that note, um, you know, conceiving of ourselves just as trying to, you know, humbly transmit the Dhamma, um, Ajahn Kobilo and I are stepping into, you know, a, a role of, say, you know, helping coalesce a community in Seattle. Mm -hmm. How should we conceive of ourselves in, in connection to that endeavor? Uh, mm -hmm. what, what would be the right language mm -hmm. around that? Yes. Um... Articulate worms. <laughs> so, so, you know, Ajahn Chah told us we still think of ourselves as worms, um, or sort of articulate worms. Um, um, I, I think it's very, and we've spoken about this before also, to um, acknowledge that lay people are hungry for biographical in information they love it they enjoy it they want to hear all about your personal story um and um eventually it will all come out over the course of the time but don't don't base your teaching style i would say on your biography uh it's like kind of a it's a cheap hit if you like it's uh you know, people come alive and they enjoy it and they thank you afterwards and they say it was really so meaningful to them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a trap. Um, and you don't mm -hmm. want to be uh, in, this is true because look at the effect it's had on me. Um, that kind of um, mm -hmm. approach, I think, is really dangerous. And um, even if there are things that, you feel you verify by yourself, um, then it's not necessary to, to express it in that way. 
you know you you've ex you you you're you're happy you you understand something to a certain degree or maybe the, um the whole thing um but you say well Ajahn Chah says this, or the Buddha says this, or the great monks, the great masters all say this. Um, and, and just to put yourself just to one side. Uh, this, this is like, as you say, humility in action, you know. But um, you only need, you only need um, a moment of... of um, lose your mindfulness and get caught in the moment and then make a statement and afterwards you think oh did I claim um, Ari, you know Anuttara uh, Manusatam uh, um, and and then you're in hell you know it's just absolute awful kind of experience where you had a doubt about whether you were claiming something or, uh, or whether lay people understood you to have made a claim and and it's just such an awful, nasty, terrible um, hole to fall into that. And so easily, I mean, you look at the other three parajikas, you know, those are really gross, coarse kind of actions. But the fourth parajika is not. Um, and it's quite conceivable that uh, for a very well-intentioned practice monk to fall into that, just a moment of, of conceit or wanting to create or sustain an image of yourself with lay people and there you go you know you're in um so as a rhetorical technique um i i really emphasize the importance of avoiding when possible talking uh, in terms of your experience and people will ask you you know well in your meditation practice uh, what is this and what, and what is that? You don't have to answer in the terms that people ask, you know. And you can just say, uh, well, what's your, what's your experience of uh, this genre or that genre or something? You say, well, um, the, the great teachers will say this and Ajahn Chah says that. Or if people are really, really pushy, you say, I'm sorry, I, um, the, my discipline doesn't allow me to, to speak about uh, my own uh, personal uh, experiences and achievements. Um, yes, it's to the end of it. And again, I've got two more questions. Um, one of them, there's a, a great short little aphorism in Thai, which yourself and P.A. Paiuto use about when one first comes to practice, one experiences a lot of suffering and very little happiness. But as one progresses, it's a mark of having progressed in the Dhamma that one experiences more happiness and less dukkha. Could you unpack that? Because it might seem counterintuitive to people. Um, yeah, I think it's more, let's say, the things that cause you, there are a lot of things that cause you dukkha and uh, relatively few things that um, lead to happiness. And the things that um, do bring happiness tend to be very fragile and short-lived, uh, whereas the things that cause you dukkha tend to last longer. So I think as you practice, the things that used to uh, cause you a lot of dukkha don't cause you so much dukkha anymore, and they don't last so long. Um, you know, I, I think most, most, most practitioners would, would have had that experience where let, let's say someone just abuses you or um, humiliates you or, or tries to put you down or, or, or something and you think wow if that had been a year or two ago I would have uh, I would have suffered so much from that and and now it's it's like yeah I, I mean I can feel it but it's just nowhere near what it used to be and that's a real sign of progress isn't it Mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes it's a bit uh, my, my analogy was like in I have a lot of cartoon analogy so you know in a in a in a cartoon where maybe someone shoots a fires a bullet or shoots an arrow and it goes right through your body and you say oh you know it just went <laughs> in the front and out the back you know well what's happening you know it's a bit like that you think 
Uh, well, mm. I hardly hurt at all. Um, mm. Then, then um, you know, given given that the more fulfilling and and um, deeper kinds of happiness and well-being come from kusala dhammas, then you know, just as the amount of dukkha. Uh, decreases as akusala dhammas decrease, then similarly the amount of sukha uh, increases as kusala dhammas increase. So you have more mindfulness, your mind's not so distracted, and then just sweeping your room or um, basic kind of um, chores can be a source of real happiness because you're, you're mindful and you're right there and, and actually work or you, you don't have to use your brain and where you can just be quite completely present. Um, I just find just more and more enjoyable. Um, the more the more you practice, the, the, the stronger your sense of gratitude, um, mm -hmm. the more the joy that comes from growing faith in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha as you verify more of the teachings and that gives more rise to more confidence and, and, and strength of faith, which makes you feel better. Um, and uh, the, the extent of informal practice that you're able to um, free yourself of the five hindrances and experience that Niramisa Sukha, then yeah, it's just uh, all good and um my my you'll remember my um, I, I don't think i can claim it's mine i just probably i i have this humble experience where things i think that um i thought up myself and then suddenly i realized somebody else has already said them it's usually <laughs> ajahn char or lump or someday but um anyway uh, this one is that uh, you know only the happy mind can understand dukkha mm. Mm. So you know the so they say oh it's all about dukkha yeah but you can't uh, understand what dukkha means with an unhappy mind because you have an unhappy mind it's this I am suffering the whole point is it's it's not it's the I am which is the suffering um, and you can only see that when your mind is is happy and stable. Mm. Uh, thank you again. Um, final question from me um, is about actually visualization practice or imagining the future as a way to encourage oneself and keep oneself kind of aiming in the direction that one wants to go. And, uh, you know, for as monks, you know, our, our goal is Nibbana or stream entry. And um, that's not so easy to imagine as like, you know, say someone who's not a monk who might imagine themselves with a million dollars in their hand, you know, driving a Corvette with like some supermodel. So I'm curious, one, if you've ever practiced kind of like monastic oh, future visualization and how would you how would you visualize stream entry or our hunt ship i thought you were going to ask you if i ever driven a corvette with a superman <laughs> no. um, answer is no um i i i, I one way of talking about it, it's like you know one of the first books that people of my generation really you know uh um read and, and were enthused about was this uh it was like a bible for a while called be here now do you ever hear about this it's oh yeah, yeah. Ram 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 be here now. so yeah and um so it's become a, it's like an, a cliche but at the same time you know if you think about it like every moment of your life you know you know if you were to be asked those two questions you know where are you here uh when is it it's now this is a constant in your life isn't it you're here now you know it's from the day you were born and in previous lives whether it was in heaven realm or I hope not in a hell realm or in a greater realm or an animal realm that's constant you know you're here now. And, and I think that in that, seen, seen in that way, it's like heaven realms, 
hell realms are just ways of talking that things that appear to the mind. So samsara is, is something that appears to the mind um, through ignorance because we don't understand the way things are. So, you know, rather than talking about gaining stream entry, gain nibbana, it's just um, letting all the ignorant stuff fall away. Mm. What would that look like? How would one look? How would, yeah. Would you be shiny or, I mean, shiny. smiling or not smiling? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know that I can answer that, that mm. question. But it is, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm not explaining myself very well, I don't think. Um, when, when I first met Lumpur Cha, you know, and I, and I, you know, and I was thinking, what is it about him? You know, that, you know, it's, it's not like, it wasn't like he has a special thing. And I think he's, He's like absolutely normal, mm. and uh, mm. wow. everyone else is abnormal. That that was that was my idea. Or you know, an analogy is like, let's say, huge number of musical instruments, and it's only one is in tune, and everyone else is uh, out of tune to one degree or another. So, for me, it's it's just like. Um, we're abnormal, you know, and, and the idea is, you know, when you realize abnormality, then the abnormality disappears. So then it's normal. So I don't know what normal looks like, you know, it's like uh, an image, whether it's <laughs> shiny or not. Um, so it's like we're creating you know, we're creating samsara moment by moment. Heaven realms, hell realms, human realm. We're creating this stuff. Um, and so what we call nibbana is just stop doing that. Why would you do that if you knew what you were doing? Um, actually, I didn't... Okay, I, so I... Uh, Tanajan, um, one thing I'm very curious about is, uh, you know, in the Mahayana, they have this concept at times of, um, well, two concepts I'm really interested in. One is uh, the concept of transmission, sort of a direct mind-to-mind -mind melding or uh, teaching. And um, that doesn't seem to be formalized so much in our tradition. And yet um, I have heard vague references to certain very powerful impacts of a mind of the mind, say with Ajahn Chah's first meeting with Ajahn Mun, or sometimes I think Ajahn Sumedho's meeting with Master Hua had elements, or maybe even to an extent what you're speaking about with Ajahn Chah. So I'm, I'm curious if you see that as something that does happen in these monastic circles. And then the other Mahayana teaching, which um, is interesting to me, is, is that of the bardo. And the idea that there's this liminal place right at death where enlightenment can occur more easily. And there's certain moments in the suttas where they do speak of, say, the spark of the mind instead of landing, just fading. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on those two, Tanajan? Um, especially transmission. I'm not sure that 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 we have that same um, idea of, of, of transmission as you know the um, Buddha holding up the flower and Mahakasapa understanding and no one else understands that that kind of thing. But um, I, I would I would say that that. Um, in the presence of uh, an enlightened master, there is, uh, you know, for, for those people who are practicing or sensitive to it, um, 
there is uh, well I could I, I can I can speak, speak personally here for me it was this you know absolute faith that yeah there is such a thing as arahantship in the world today and and of course i i didn't have the kind of psychic powers or any ability to to know that but that was that was what you know i i i felt and i um and and i would say that in the early years of monkhood you know that more than anything else uh, sustained me you know to have that you know absolute faith that yeah it's possible here and now and um so that's one thing i i think just being in the presence of someone it doesn't it's not a matter of having to um, be around them for a long time and receiving teachings from them it's just, that that's a more kind of immediate impact thing but also in the, in the presence of of a monk, monks and uh, of that stature, then you feel that they're like mirrors, you know, like you're aware of every single little defilement and uh, in your mind, you know, and you feel an absolute um, necessity to, to practice. So that, that, that's, I, I think that that's also something that, again, you know, you just feel that, you know, um, this is just un, un, unsupportable, you know, to, to, to carry on um, indulging in this way. And, 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 you know, it's just exposed to the light, um, anything that you would have liked to uh, turn your back on or conceal from yourself. And the so I, I I would see it more in, on that kind of the psychological um, effects of of being close to someone or or just visiting, paying respects to even uh, much not necessarily having to be a close student of um, it's just something really um, deep that that you know that, that you don't forget and stays with you. I um, was having a conversation with a very learned layman recently who knows the Pali Canon quite well. And uh, the topic of like modern technology came up and he made a very emphatic statement. Like if the Buddha was around today, of course he would not have allowed monks to use cell phones. And he said, don't you think so too? And I was a bit taken aback because I'd never directly asked myself that question. And while there are, I know of, you know, senior monks who I believe might be attained um, great monks, I mean, you say like Lumpur Liam, Ajahn Tan, who very much, you know, either have no interest um, or just on principle are not interested and see it as not being a good example for, for younger monks. But also, I know other senior monks who I might have the faith are, are attained who do use cell phones. And I'm curious what your take is. Um, you know, do you think the Buddha would have allowed, you know, monks to use the following technologies? One, like cell phones, and two, say, um, social media. What, what do you think um, is a wise, wise take on that allowance or prohibition or some kind of conditional permission? I'm going to say I don't know. Um, I don't think it's so clear cut. I mean, if, if you... Imagine the, uh, that the environment in which Buddhist monks live today um, was more or less the same as it was 2,500 years ago. Yeah, but it, it's not. And, um, you know, there are, um, you know, the, the culture, the environment, the um, natural world, everything has is, is changed, obviously, but the complexity and the, um, I, I, 
I don't I don't think that 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 use of cell phones is automatically and necessarily um, going to lead to a decrease in kusaladamas and an increase in akusaladamas. Um, having said that, I, I think that uh, there should be um, you know, very strict uh, or much stricter regulations and agreements about how cell phones are used and which monastics can use them and under what circumstances they can be used. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that, that they are, you know, um, the devil's spawn and that they should be um, thrown out altogether. I mean, I, I mean, I just um, uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, I, I had a FaceTime call with my mum in England in the old people's home, and um, I think the Buddha would have kind of understood that and. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have felt that it was really a, a bad thing. And it, it is more a matter of separating the, you know, the, the useful from the um, useless. Um, you know, on a practical level in terms of study, you know, being able just to get on your, you know, your phone and, and just look up Sutta Central and look up a Sutta just like that, you know, on, I mean that's that's magic, isn't it? It's, it's wonderful. Um, but there, it is also the door to distraction and time wasting and 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 so on, which things which definitely the Buddha would have been uh, very critical of. Mm. So I, I I think it's a, it's a matter of monastic communities coming up with agreements about how these things should be handled and. Um, so I mean very simply you know to maximize the, the positive and minimize the, the negative but, uh, yeah. um, Anajan would you uh, I don't think we want to take much more of your time but uh, I'm curious if you had um, you know a uh, say one book recommendation uh, for us. Um, we, we got the beautiful questions book. Um, you did. Good, yes. Yeah. yeah. Do you have another one for us going forward? Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm, I'm just uh, reading to my Sangha this one. The, mm. Oh, okay. It disappeared. <laughs> yeah, um, you probably got this. The excursions into the thought world of the Pali discourses by Ben Vornalio. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's a really good sort of basic um, presentation of key dhammas and it's a good good textbook. Um, I, yeah, I don't have a new new book on the on the go really to to recommend right now. If I if I do find something, I'll I'll, I'll send you a note. Thank you, and how about just perennial recommendation for us or lay people, or just is there is there a book, whether Dhamma book or otherwise, that you would recommend it should be required reading for anyone who's aspiring to be a mature adult? <laughs> aspiring to be a mature adult. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, my, my book on a desert island would be the Thai version of Buddha Dhamma. Um, the Thai version. Oh. That's Ajahn, Ajahn Pasanos as well, although his was the English version, I believe. <laughs> so. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm too attached to the Thai. I mean, the English version is okay. It's quite accurate, but it's not quite so. Um, well, Thank you, Tanajan. No, no. Yeah, let me let me just give you give me a moment. Yeah. Um, 
I, what, what something you know because originally you were going to ask me about Jane Austen or something and and uh, I uh, what I what I wanted to say is like as a child I, I had no sense of connection or interest in in Christianity except I like some of the stories and um, but the my sort of moral education um, came through literature um and uh, shakespeare in particular but but the, the point that i wanted to make was that um you know how how do we get people to see the tote of defilement and see the uh the kuna the the beauty the nobility of kusla dhammas and i think in, in in that, in many cases, literature does a wonderful job. You know, there's mm. the uplifting, you know, you could, you could give a Dhamma talk about self-sacrifice or you could give a, a Dhamma talk about kindness and so on. And yeah, I mean, um, you may well be able to do a good job. But when you, when you read a book and there's a, somebody in it who just, in someone you begin to develop this, this real appreciation for and then they act kindly or they uh, the acts of self-sacrifice you know like in like a tale of two cities by charles dickens where he makes that it's a far far greater thing i do now than i've ever done before and um, and they stick in your mind for all your life you know so and in in um in defilements and things as well like shakespeare you know you have Jealous Othello is the expression of jealousy. Um, Iago is the, the betrayer, the the bad friend, you know. And um, Macbeth is, you know, a case study on how someone becomes corrupted by power. And 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 so having all these um, kind of immaterial nama dhammas embodied and expressed in in real figures, people who, who you can relate to. Um, I, I think that's a, a really important part of, of an education. And, um, and that's, that was really, you know, how I, I, I was educated in that way. Um, Thank you. Can I jump okay, in? Then. Maybe, may we pay respects? Yes, lovely speaking with you. Take care, both of you. Be in touch again. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you so much. Much.